Warning, this video will contain spoilers up to chapter 1036. You've been warned. Hello, my Nakamotachi, this is Joy Girl, and I want to talk about a topic that I'm sure is on everyone's mind as a result of the latest chapters. So you guys know that I've discussed Kaido's backstory in the past multiple times, and they haven't performed so well. So usually I pin that down to the fact that we didn't know much about Kaido's backstory, and a lot of discussions centered around speculations and possibly wild long stretches. But a lot of you guys will also know that since chapter 1014, when Kaido made that comment to Luffy, that Luffy couldn't be Joy Boy either it seems, it seemed like Kaido once thought that he himself could be Joy Boy. And now with the most recent chapters in chapter 1035 and 36, that's almost close to being confirmed. Except that there has been a curveball thrown in there because it's not quite clear whether this is something that Kaido thought of himself or whether this is something that King has projected onto him. Because if you look at chapter 1035, it does seem like Kaido believes that he himself is the one that is Joy Boy. When he meets King or when he meets Arba, as he was still known back then, Albert, Kaido says that only he could change the world. And if this also meant that he knew of who Joy Boy was and if he believed that he was, therefore Joy Boy, then the most likely explanation as to how Kaido became aware of Joy Boy, this prophesized figure, would be through Roxy Zebek. We know that Zebek was looking into and researching into the world's taboos or the world's secrets, and so it's very well possible that Joy Boy was one of those. And maybe Roxy Zebek actually believed that he was Joy Boy, and maybe Kaido believed that Zebek was, but then the events of God Valley proved that Zebek wasn't. And so maybe this will was passed down to Kaido. But then we flash forward to chapter 1036, where both Kaido and King are older than what we saw of their flashback in chapter 1035, but obviously still younger than present day. And now it seems like King was the one that told Kaido that Kaido would be Joy Boy. Because we see Kaido ask King whether King still believes that Kaido could be Joy Boy. So because of this, it seems like King is actually the one who introduced Kaido to Joy Boy, who at least said that Kaido is Joy Boy. And this could also make sense in a number of ways. I've seen theories about the possibility of Joy Boy being a giant or an Oni, given the large hat that we saw at Marijuana. And so was Kaido's Oni-like appearance what made King think that Kaido could be Joy Boy? But the most obvious connection that I made was actually through King's Lunarian race. And so there are a lot of speculations about the Lunarian race and the connection to the other sky-dwelling races. And I've made a video on that, so make sure to check it out if you haven't yet. But given that the idea of a sun god was first introduced to us in the Skypiea arc, and if this is indeed the same sun god Nika that Who's Who introduced to us much more recently, if this is the same deity figure, is it also possible that they were also referring to Joy Boy? Is sun god Nika Joy Boy all the same person? And if so, is it the case that all sky-dwelling races, including the Lunarians, knew of this legend, of this figure. But either way, whether it was through Roxy Zebek or whether it was through King, whether it was through someone else or something else, something that is at least a little clearer is that a younger Kaido seemed to have been a brighter Kaido. When we see Kaido rescuing Albert from Punk Hazard, Kaido has this bright smile that makes him really resemble Luffy and Roger. From their appearance, their bright smiles, but also the way that they each recruited their respective first crewmates. But a detail that I have haven't seen people discuss about their appearance at Punk Hazard in the flashback is a connection that we could make to a comment, a flyaway comment that Big Mom made. In chapter 989, when Big Mom's looking at the numbers, she makes a comment that, oh, these are the numbers that Kaido bought from Punk Hazard. And this line has always stuck with me. I've always found it a little bit odd because the word that she uses is bought, not brought, bought, as in Kaido paid money for these numbers. And this actually suggests a lot about Kaido and his character. For one, I think it's quite odd that a fearsome beast, a strong beast like Kaido would pay for the numbers instead of taking them by force. And it also raises a lot of questions and speculations about who did Kaido buy the numbers from and, and for what reason? Now, there are a lot of interesting possibilities, but the fact that Kaido bought them from Punk Hazard does suggest to me that this would be most likely connected to Vegapunk. Given what we know that it was Vegapunk who was experimenting on Kaido, who extracted his lineage factor, and it was Vegapunk who was working on Punk Hazard. So yes, I think the most obvious answer would be that Kaido bought the numbers from Vegapunk. But again, I think it just says a lot about Kaido that he would choose to pay the 
man who was conducting experiments on him. And maybe it will actually be because Kaido knows about the history of Mads and maybe Kaido knows of Vegapunk's allegiance, which we obviously don't know about. Or maybe given the relationship of Mads, how Vegapunk and Queen were connected, this is actually where Kaido met Queen and maybe Kaido bought the numbers from Queen instead, who was also working at Punk Hazard and Queen also decided to work for Kaido instead. Anyways, the other interesting question is why Kaido bought the numbers. Because let's be honest, the numbers have been quite underwhelming. <laughs> Apart from the intrigue in the relationship between Yamato and Fuga, the numbers just really haven't been all that impressive. And look, maybe that was actually a surprise to Kaido as well. But at the least, we can say that the numbers fit into the beast theme of Kaido's crew. It really does seem like he's gone out of his way to build and craft this specifically beast themed crew. If you look at the members of his crew that are closest to him personally, we've got King a Lunarian, we've got Jack who's a fishman, even Black Maria who we don't know what specifically what her race is yet, or even Ulti and Page One. It's like Kaido is really surrounding himself with beasts like him. And this is another detail that I don't think gets discussed widely. But in Kaido's comment to Yamato in chapter 1025, Kaido says to Yamato that Yamato can't be friends with humans as a child of an Oni. As an Oni, Yamato can't expect to be accepted by the citizens, by the human citizens of Wano. And it seems to me that maybe Kaido is projecting here. And maybe this is a clue as to how Kaido turned sour. We know both Kaido and King shared a dream to change the world. Somewhere along the way, they both got jaded. Now, Kaido was still laughing about this in chapter 1036. He was laughing and asking King whether the world that he was creating, the change that he was bringing about, was the change that King envisioned. And King was now adamant that it doesn't matter as long as Kaido is the strongest. And so from that little exchange, there is a question to be had as to whether the dreams that Kaido and King had were always the same. Did the change that they envision always align? And from from their conversation in chapter 1035, I'm inclined to say that they were. And so then if we're to think about the change that they wanted, I think it could be along the lines of the power of the world government and the power of the celestial dragons, the way that they discriminate other citizens, especially special races like the Lunarians, like possibly the Oni, the reason why both Kaido and King were being experimented on. You know, it's even possible that these races were wiped out for that very reason. And both Kaido and King wanted to change that. And maybe that's why Kaido wanted to build a beast pirate's crew. Maybe he wanted to give a home for beasts, for the outcasts. And maybe that's why he bought the numbers. He didn't want them to come under the world government's rule and he didn't want the numbers to be used by the world government. Because even as depraved as Kaido is and all the horrible stuff that he's inflicted on the Wano citizens, it seems like those close to him really like him a lot and really respect him. Even Kaido himself seems to be like a loving father figure to, to his top officers, so long as you're not his actual child. But this could actually be why Kaido chose Wano as his base, because we know from chapter 1016 that Kaido chose Wano intentionally. And maybe the reason behind that is because Kaido knew that Wano is isolated from the rest of the world, closed off, where the world government don't intervene, he wanted a place where beasts like himself could roam freely. So essentially, Kaido and King thought that Kaido could be Joy Boy and change the world that discriminated against other races. And this is certainly a theme in One Piece. We have the fishmen and even the way that the mink dukes were treated when they arrived at Wano. But then somewhere along the line, they realized that Kaido couldn't be Joy Boy. And maybe this is timeline related, similar to how Roger knew that he was too early. Maybe they realized that Kaido couldn't be Joy Boy because he too was too early. Maybe it was something else. But whatever it was, they realized that Kaido couldn't be Joy Boy. And maybe this is where Kaido's switch flipped. Instead of the bright-eyed, happy, could-be joy boy, he turned into sad boy. And maybe this is where their dreams changed. And if he couldn't be joy boy, maybe Kaido became much more intent in becoming the world's strongest creature so that he could destroy the world that sought to eradicate beasts like him. And given all the horrible stuff that Kings endured as a Lunarian, maybe that's why he still supports Kaido even with this change in ideals. That's why we 
we see him say in the flashback in chapter 1036, it doesn't matter if Kaido is a legend or not, so long as he's the strongest, so that the world will feel their message, you will hear their message through strength. Or maybe it's not quite so aggressive. The reason why they're so invested into Kaido's strength in becoming the Pirate King, even if he isn't Joy Boy, is because he will still be someone strong enough, someone powerful enough to change the world. Someone who will still be able to protect beasts like them. Someone who'll be able to change the world so that beasts like them can live in peace. But in any case, even though Kaido is now aware that he is not Joy Boy, now that he knows that such a figure exists, he's still interested in meeting Joy Boy. He still wants to find out who this Joy Boy is. I mean, if he spent so much time wanting to be Joy Boy, he wants to meet the guy who's going to be Joy Boy. He wants to find out who this Joy Boy is and what he has that Kaido didn't. There is a bit of an inconsistency though as to why Kaido would then attempt suicide multiple times. And I can only peg that down to his extremely depressed nature or the fact that he thought that, hey, if I can't be Joy Boy, at the very least, I am going to carve out a name for myself. I am going to become a legend so that I'll go down in the history books as a legend and as a beast. And this could actually be seen as sort of the driving force for a lot of Kaido's actions. That even if he can't change the world, he will at least carve out a piece of the world for beasts. This could be what he meant when he announced the new Onigashima project that he's going to make Wano a lawless pirate's haven. The words that Kaido used was, it would be a place for all manner of pirates. Does he mean all manner in the sense of all types, as in all races, as in beasts? Did he mean that a place where all beasts can roam free. And this could be why he went to Marineford to make a name for himself, to have a legendary end. But then something strange about Marineford is that obviously he turned back. After being stopped by Shanks, he turned back. Because that's actually something else that I've always found a little bit odd. The fact that Kaido and Shanks didn't fight, especially given what we know about Kaido, his propensity to fight other strong people, he's not one to back down from a fight. And I guess it hasn't been technically confirmed that they did not fight but I think given what we saw of Shanks when he arrives only two days later at Marineford Shanks was unscathed and yeah the redhead pirates and Shanks are all powerful they're all strong but it's just hard to believe that they went up against another Yonko and still they were completely unharmed. So then knowing Kaido, why would Kaido not fight? Why would he turn back? Why would he not go to Marineford? And the only thing that I can think of is if Shanks gave him a reason not to fight and if Shanks gave him a reason to turn back. If Kaido was looking for a legendary end, if he wanted to become involved at Marineford so that he could have a similar fate like Whitebeard, maybe when Shanks interfered feared and faced Kaido, he told Kaido that Joy Boy would emerge from this war and that it was still too early for Kaido to become involved. Maybe Shanks told him to go back to live another day because the one that you're waiting for will arrive. And maybe that's why Kaido turned back. Which says a lot about what Shanks knows, which we obviously don't know, but it does seem like Shanks is privy to a lot more than he lets on. So that could be why Kaido had turned back, and maybe that's why he's instigated this current war that he's announced, so that he can attract other potential Joy Boys. Or maybe he already even knew that Joy Boy would actually come to Wano, because there's another interesting detail that's often missed, and that's in chapter 972, Odin's telling the scabbards there will come a time when a figure will come to change the world and that Wano must be prepared to welcome him and to work alongside this figure. And what's interesting is that it seems like Orochi and Kaido can hear him. And Orochi dismisses what Odin's saying as babbling, but Kaido looks a little, he looks a little irked and curious. There's a question mark in his dialogue, but he doesn't necessarily look very surprised. So maybe Kaido already actually knew that George Joy Boy would be coming to Wano. But I do think that all of this could play a really crucial role in the fight between Kaido and Luffy and how that fight concludes and how Wano as an arc wraps up. Oda said in the past that Luffy doesn't kill his opponents because in the world of pirates, one's dreams and one's ideology means much more than life or death. And Luffy breaking down someone's will, his opponent's will, is what is true victory. And we could see this in a hugely meaningful 
meaningful way between Kaido and Luffy. For one, because this is actually a core part of Kaido's character. Kaido doesn't kill his opponents. He likes to break down their will. But for Kaido, it's a lot more strength centric. It's all about breaking down their will so that they submit under his rule. Whereas it's different in Luffy's case who punches down an opponent to break down their beliefs, their ideology and how they see the world. And Kaido right now is really like that dark timeline Luffy that Oda likes to draw as a good and bad timeline in the SBS. He's a depressed and bitter failed joy boy who just wanted all races to be free. Whereas Luffy's the one that's going to be able to show Kaido that he's the one, he's the joy boy that's going to achieve this, that he's not going to give up. Freedom is the theme that is so so inherently tied to Luffy's character. That and friendship. You know, Luffy doesn't care if you're a monster or not. In fact, if you're a monster, he probably likes you instantly. That and if you give him food. <laughs> and once Luffy proves that to Kaido, maybe that's when Luffy will beat Kaido because Kaido will, will relent. He will acquiesce to Luffy. And that could be how Luffy defeats Kaido. And this could actually fit in and work so well with a lot of other developments currently going on at Wano. We know that the world government fleet are on their way in case they need to intervene if the Yonko go down. What if Kaido, now recognizing that Luffy is Joy Boy, Kaido is actually going to be the one that stops the world government? Sort of like a film Z moment. Because then this could tie up so many things, like the comment that the anime director made, the potential spoiler, the potential accidental reveal that there is a final enemy, a big enemy after Kaido. What if that's the world government? But surprisingly, instead of it being an enemy that Luffy and the Straw Hats have to face, Kaido stops them and fights them instead. Kaido holds them off instead as an enemy to the cause. And then this could also fulfill Kaido's wish to die a legendary death. And I know some people don't like the idea of Kaido dying because then that would be the villain, the antagonist getting what they want. But if it works out in the story that Kaido now recognizes Luffy as Joy Boy and has joined his cause, and is now protecting Luffy, protecting the Straw Hats, Wano, protecting the next generation, protecting this new era, this new dawn, then I think that Kaido could be redeemed and Oda could give him what he wants. But that's just where my head has been at about Kaido and Joy Boy, his backstory and what it will mean for the future of Wano. And I'd be interested in hearing what you guys have to say, so make sure to leave a comment below. Don't forget to like and share the video. Please do subscribe if you'd like to hear more One Piece discussions. You can also join our Joy Fleet Discord server or even become a Patreon member and I thank all of my Patreon members for help supporting the channel. This is Joy Girl and I'll see you again soon.